here today, and uh, I want to just say thank you again to Pastor Noel for the invitation to be here uh, for, for this time. He, he's persistent and patient, and after a few years, we were able to work this out, and I'm so glad because one of the things I've enjoyed, Pastor, about being here is getting to know you better and to get to know your heart, and I think you know how blessed you are to have Pastor Noel here as your pastor. Would you agree that the Lord has brought you uh, a, a great pastor here? Uh, you, you have a history of wonderful pastors at this church, but I believe that he's brought Pastor Noel here for this chapter and for such a time as this, and for your delightful family. Uh, thank you for your hospitality to me this, this weekend. And I wanna say thank you to you as a church I want to bring you greetings, first of all, on behalf of two and a half million Nazarenes around the world, in 162 countries of the world, and that means that you're a part of a really, really big global family, and the Brockington Road Church and your uh, rich history has always been supportive, as far as I know, of the mission of the church around the world, and we could not do what we do without the faithfulness uh, of sacrificial gifts, of giving, of your time, of your resources, and of your going. So thank you for that and, and for being a part of that. Well, we've been talking about what it means to, uh, to look like Jesus and to live like Jesus. And we've been talking, first of all, about obedience to Jesus means uh, that we say, but because you say so, I will, even when we don't understand and even when it makes no sense to... Us at the time, we say yes, because we know that, number one, he knows more than we do, and number two, we love him, and we want to honor and please him. We also talked about the fact that, that holiness has to be held in balance between uh, different aspects of both. It has to be personal, and it has to be social, meaning that, that it has to obviously change our lives, but it means we turn our attention to the needs of other people. Holiness also happens in a moment. Our hearts are purified by faith, but there's a lifetime of growing that goes on. So it's instantaneous and it's progressive. We, we are sanctified in a moment. We grow for a lifetime. And, and then we talked about the fact that it's, it's both uh, practical, but it's spiritual. It's a work of the Spirit, but we have, to, we have to engage practices for holiness to have its full effect in our life. And this morning, I want to look at the idea of what we love most. Before we do that, though, where's Charles? Charles, right back here. Is this your birthday? Happy birthday to you. Your 60th birthday. Awesome. I, I just saw that uh, in the bulletin this morning, so happy birthday to you. Take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to uh, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, anybody know where that is in the Bible? That's the first book, so it ought to be easy for you to find. Very, very familiar story. I know that this is one you've heard before, but I, I hope that the Lord will speak to you in a way maybe that you've not heard before on this story. And I would invite you to stand with me, please, as we honor the reading of God's Word. Picking up the reading with verse 1, chapter 22. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. 
The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. This is the word of God for the people of God. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together, may they be pleasing and acceptable to you. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So what do you do with a text that tells you from the very beginning that what you are about to hear is a test from God? And what do you do with words that say, take your son, your your only son, Isaac, whom you love? Some people say that maybe Abraham was just going a little batty in his old age. You know, what can happen after decades of baking in the Middle Eastern sun. Other people say, Abraham, he just misunderstood what God was saying because one bad lamb chop could give you dreams in the night that normally you wouldn't have. Some people even say that Abraham was just conforming to the cultural practices of that were prevalent among his day where Canaanite neighbors would often sacrifice their children to the gods who were unpredictable and unappeasing. And people say all kinds of things about what Abraham heard that night. But the one thing you cannot convince me of is that Abraham didn't know the voice of God when he heard it. You don't become nicknamed the friend of God for nothing. I hadn't talked to my best friend from high school in probably more than 20 years. And not long ago, he called me on the phone. And all he said was, David. And I said, Chris, is that you? I hadn't talked to him in all of those years, and yet I still knew his voice. Why? Because we were best friends. And Abraham knew God's voice. He had been walking with God now for 50 years. And there had been too many things happen along the way. There had been too many conversations, too intimate a friendship for him not to know the voice of God when he spoke. And this text will not let us decide anything different than that. Abraham had heard God's voice promise to make him a blessing. Abraham had heard God's voice promise that he would inherit the land of Canaan, the promised land. And most importantly, Abraham had heard God's voice promise to give him a son, and against all odds, it actually happened. It wasn't supposed to happen. It shouldn't have happened. Let's face it, Abraham and Sarah were old. And I don't mean old, I mean old, old. Abraham was 99, and Sarah was 89. When God said, this time next year, Sarah's going to be pregnant with your child. And they said, good one, God. That's funny. I mean, Sarah hadn't even had hot flashes for 30 years. (laughs) Abraham was to the age now. He spent all day watching the Weather Channel and drinking prune juice. But look at what God did. All of a sudden, Sarah's having morning sickness. She's craving dill pickles. She's wearing maternity clothes. She's sleeping with a full body pillow. Her girlfriends down at the church, they throw her a baby shower. Abraham kind of liked going to the barber shop and have all of his old checker buddies punch him in the arm and say, you old rascal, you. And the next thing you know, Abraham's standing right there in front of the labor and delivery nurseries, looking through the glass, up through trifocals that are a little bit fogged over. He's staring there at the little tiny bundle in the crib. I I picture in my mind, there's another father standing next to him. He's 22, Abraham's 100. (laughs) Abraham kind of pokes him. He says, see, you see that one right over there? That one second from the left? 
That's my boy. And the whole thing was so hilarious and totally improbable that when it came time to name him, you know what they named him? They named him Laughter. Isaac. Heck, one of my friends said they named him Punchline. It's an incredible thing that God did. God kept his promise. So don't tell me that Abraham didn't know the voice when he heard it. And not only did Abraham know the voice, but Abraham knew the command because he'd heard the command before. And they weren't the exact words that night that they were so many years before, but, but they were similar when he heard the voice in Haran that said, go forth from your country, go forth from your family, go forth from your clan to a land that I will show you. It was risky then, it was risky now. That's what God said to him, go forth to a place I will show you. It was the exact same words, only with one big exception. Because before, if God was asking him to give up his comfort and to give up his security, this time God was asking him to do something far different. It was to give up his, his greatest love and his dearest joy. I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. How many of you know that burnt offerings is not halfway? That's total. It's terrifying. It's a terrifying command. Because Abraham loved Isaac more than he loved himself. And now God was asking him, give him back to me. And Abraham had to decide, how am I going to respond to this? How would you respond? God said, Abraham. And Abraham said, Hineni, here I am, Lord. This, this word, Hineni, is, is a Hebrew word. It's a fascinating word that means here I am, right here, right now, willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Here I am. Now, I am not suggesting for a second that this decision to obey came easy for Abraham, and I'm not going to say that it was without some anguish and some pain. I mean, for all we knew, he might have spent all night long wrestling with God about this decision. But what this text wants to make very clear to us is, is that Abraham did not falter to obey the command of God. Abraham did not shrink back from obedience to God. And the reason he didn't falter is because, very simply, Abraham believed that God could do what God had never done before, if that's what God had to do in order to keep his promise. Let me say that one more time. Abraham believed that God could do what God had never done before if that's what God had to do in order to keep God's promise. God was asking him to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham had the faith to believe that God could bring him back to life. I might have lost. Okay. Hebrews 11 says this for us. Abraham believed that God could raise the dead. Now, how did Abraham know that? Abraham had never seen Lazarus raised from a tomb. He hadn't seen a little girl in Capernaum raised from the dead. He didn't even know that one day Jesus, the Son of God, was going to be resurrected from the dead. Abraham didn't know any of that. He didn't even understand resurrection. But he did know this. He knew God had the power to create something that God, that he'd never seen before. His own life was proof of that. And that's why he told his two servants that were with him in verse 5, we will worship here and we will return to you. Abraham believed God was able to do what God had never done before if that's what God had to do in order to keep his promise. I don't think he fully understood what God was asking him to do, but after 50 years of walking with God, Abraham did understand this much. God is dependable. 
And so it says here in the text, early, someone say early. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he saddled his donkey. Why does it say early? I just think it means Abraham didn't sit around for a week and debate whether or not God really spoke to him. I don't think he had any conversations with Sarah. I don't think he called a special board meeting. I don't think he did any of that. I think he just said, I now know what God wants me to do. Here I am, Lord, ready to obey you in this moment. And he did, and it was immediate. The next word you hear, see here is that it says, Abraham chopped the wood for the sacrifice. Abraham did that. Now, why would he do that? Remember, he's 100 years old right now. That's a recipe for a heart attack. I mean, he had two servants right there with him. He probably had dozens of other servants who could have cut the wood for him. Uh, and, and two were standing right there. So why would Abraham do that and exert himself? I think it's because Abraham said, this is part of my obedience. Nobody else can do this for me. Nobody else can take the place of my obedience to God. And so Abraham cut the wood. And then it says they began their journey. They traveled for three days toward the region of Moriah. That's really important because Moriah is today where Jerusalem would be. And finally, Abraham sees the mountain off in the distance and he, he tells the two young servants, the two men who are with him, stay here, Isaac and I are going to go on. And then it says he took the torch in one hand and he took the knife in the other and then he put the wood for the sacrifice on Isaac's back to carry it up the mountain. Which raises kind of an interesting question for me is, how old do you think Isaac was at this point? If he was a little boy, why would Abraham make him carry an entire rick of wood up the side of a mountain? The answer is he wouldn't have. See, most Bible scholars believe Isaac was not a little boy, but he's actually a young man. When this episode takes place, you say, well, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say Isaac was a boy? Yes, but you got to understand the culture of that day. In Genesis 21, we find out that Isaac has already been weaned from his mother. And typically, Hebrew children were weaned between the ages of four and five years old. And then in chapter 22, it begins by saying, some time later. And in some time later in the scripture doesn't mean the next day. It means a period of years has gone by. So he's at least a young teenager. Josephus, who was the greatest Jewish historian, secular historian of the first century, he says that Isaac was about 25 years old when this story takes place. But in some ways, it doesn't really matter if Isaac was 18 or if he was 30. The point here is that Isaac was a full-grown man. By now, he was full grown, not only capable of carrying an entire rick of firewood up the side of a mountain, but don't you think he was very capable of resisting a man who was now 100 years old himself? Think about it. So I want you to get the picture in your mind of an elderly man panting and out of breath. He's, he's trying to climb up the side of the mountain and he's got this young man beside him holding on to his arm. I got you, Dad. Stay with me, Dad. And they're inching their way up the side of this mountain. And as they walk along, Isaac helping his father ascend that mountain, he speaks the very first words that we hear from the lips of Isaac in all the Bible. Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb? For the sacrifice. And Abraham says, God's got this, Isaac. God himself will provide a lamb. He says, God will see to it. And suddenly we begin to realize that all the tables have been turned. Because see, we thought in the beginning that this was a test of Abraham's faith. But in reality, God is also on the line in this. It's not just about what Abraham is going to do. This has something to do about what God is going to do. And Abraham says God himself is going to provide the lamb. 
And so they reach the top of the mountain and Abraham constructs an altar. And then moving very slowly, he spreads that wood across the top while Isaac stands to the side. And then Isaac says, or Abraham says, lay down, son. Lay down. And Abraham begins to bind his own son. There's entire books that have been written just on the binding part of Isaac. And I think it's really significant that there's no record of a conversation during this binding. There's no discussion. But there's also no record of a struggle. You say, David, I thought that Isaac was a full-grown man. Don't you think he could have fought off a man that by now is probably 120 years old? Of course he could have. And yet he doesn't do that. Why? Because I believe that deep within the heart of hearts of Isaac, he has come to trust the God that his father trusted. He has watched his dad day in and day out. He'd seen his faithfulness. He'd seen his unqualified surrender. He'd seen God coming through. And somewhere along the way, I think some kind of faith has passed over into Isaac's heart. And though he doesn't understand, I think in his heart, he also believes God is dependable. And Abraham binds him to the wood. Can you imagine the awesome moment when the eyes of Abraham catch the eyes of his son, his dearest love and his greatest joy lying on God's altar. I have a question for you, and it's a really big question. What is your Isaac? What, what is the thing that you love the most and, and that you're most afraid to lose? Now, I'm not asking you what you would gladly be rid of. All of us can think of things we don't want. It's not a sickness. I can promise you that. It's not fear. It's not a bad relationship. I mean, those are the things we gladly get rid of. If, you, if you're glad to be rid of something, it's not your Isaac. But I'm talking about the thing that has been one of God's greatest gifts to you, the thing that brings you the most joy, that's most beautiful in your life, that is most satisfying, that you, that you can't imagine possibly living without. So for some of you, your Isaac could be your child, or your Isaac could be a relationship, or it could be a dream, or it could be your career, or it could be your image, it could be what people think of you. Your Isaac could be your, your way of life that you're very comfortable with. And, and I hesitate to try to qualify it any more than that because sometimes what we love the most can be so deeply entrenched in us that even we have a hard time fully understanding it ourselves. But here's when you know what your Isaac is. Here's when you know. Whenever it gets threatened... Or whenever we're in danger of losing it, we have one of two reactions. We either get very, very afraid or we get very, very angry. And we start trying to rein it in. We start trying to secure it. We start trying to really protect it. And we start hanging on until our knuckles are white trying to make something happen. Bottom line, here's what we do. We start trying to control it. And that's when we know what our Isaac is. Whenever we try to control it above all other things, even to the point that we actually do this, we have walked with God for a period of time, but we start even withholding it from God. Because what that means is that if we were to give our control over to God, it means that it would be in his control and not our control. And that test us. That is the moment of a huge test in your life because the greatest test of your faith and of my faith is not letting go of our sin. Who doesn't want to let go of your brokenness? It's not letting go of your guilt. It's not letting go of your pain. It's not letting go of your bad judgment. 
The greatest test of our faith is will I trust God with what is most dear to me? Will I even give my Isaac fully into his control? You know, the heart of holiness is that God wants to bring us to a point in our relationship with him where we can lay our Isaac on God's altar and say, here I am, Lord, right here, right now, willing to do whatever you ask of me, taking my hands off even what is my greatest joy and my dearest love. And I'm not just going to give it to you, God, because I'm afraid that you're going to take it away from me if I don't, that I'm afraid you're going to, I'm going to lose it if I don't. But I willingly lay my Isaac down because I really do want everything in your control. So that is the ultimate question, I think, of the sanctified life. Is everything in your life on God's altar? Is everything surrendered to him and completely in his control, including, including that which you love the most? You say, is that, is that anywhere else in, in scripture or is this just one story? I want you to think in your mind back to the story in Matthew chapter 19. It's, it's the story of the rich young man, the rich young ruler. This, this powerful, influential, very sharp young man came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, I want you, first of all, keep the commandments. And the guy said, I've done all of those things since I was a little boy. Is there anything else? And Jesus said these words to him. There's just one thing that you're lacking. If you want to be perfect, and the word there for perfect doesn't mean if you want to be without mistake or if you never want to have a bad judgment again. That's not what the word perfect in the Bible means. It means if you want to be complete, if you want to be completely whole the way God intends you to be whole, then I want you to go and sell all that you have and give the money to the poor. And then I want you to come and follow me. But the Bible said that the young man went away really sad because he said, I can't give you that. I can't surrender that Isaac in my life. Come back to that in just a second. One of my favorite holiness preachers, maybe you've, for you too, is, is Dennis Kinlaw. Dennis Kinlaw passed away last year, and, uh, but, but an amazing holiness preacher and I remember the first time I heard him talk about holiness in person. He said, do you want to know what holiness is? Holiness means there's not a corner of your life that is shut off from the control of Jesus Christ. Not a corner of your life, not one little tiny corner, not 99.9% .9 his and half a percent for you to keep. There's not one corner shut off. Let's go back to this rich young ruler for a minute. Here's what's interesting to me. As far as I know, Jesus never asked any other person in the Gospels to go and sell everything they had and give it to the poor. And those of us who are middle class can be pretty happy about that. So why did he ask that young man to do that? I think it's because Jesus knew that in his heart, this young man was saying, I'll obey you in everything except my money. I'll, I'll give you everything I have except control over my finances. Don't touch that corner of my life. And Jesus said, there's just one thing you lack. You don't trust me. Because I'm not asking for 99% of your life. I'm asking for all of you. Holiness means there's not a corner of my life shut off from the control of Jesus Christ. And that's why the man went away sad. It's because Jesus asked him for more than he felt like he could give. And on that day, when God called Abraham to walk with him and to be blameless, that's the kind of life he was calling him to lead, a life of 100% control of God over his life until there wasn't a corner of Abraham's life that was shut off from God's control. And that's why we often say that Abraham was the father of faith. 
Because Abraham from the beginning was all in and he didn't even know Jesus. He held nothing back from God, even his dearest love and his greatest joy. So back to the mountain. There is Abraham. He's standing over Isaac. He's holding nothing back. And Abraham looks into the heavens and he raises the knife. And suddenly God calls out, Abraham, Abraham. Listen, if you're Isaac, you want God to yell. Right? Abraham. Hin and E, it's the exact same word. Here I am, Lord. I'm still listening. And this is what God says to him. Lay down the life, the knife, Abraham. Because now I know that you love me and you have not withheld even your son from me. Abraham looks up and he sees that there's a ram caught by his, its horns in the bushes. He and Isaac go and untangle the ram and they bring it over and they sacrifice it in Isaac's place. And here's the most beautiful thing, I think, of the whole story. Not only does God actually see to the sacrifice like Abraham knew that he would, but God gave Abraham his dearest love back. Only this time it was even better because now his Isaac wasn't partially consecrated to God. His Isaac was fully consecrated. And Abraham said, I know what we're going to call this place. The Lord will provide. This mountain will be called, the Lord will provide. And if that story sounds familiar to you, it's because it actually foreshadows a much bigger story. Because on the day that God looked down on Abraham and Isaac, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, we will never ask them to sacrifice what we are not willing to give first. We will see to it. And they did. And the Bible tells us that God the Father sent his one and only son that he loved and that that son carried his wood for his sacrifice up that very same hill in Jerusalem and that Jesus became the Lamb of God that willingly laid his life down. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down as a ransom for many so that we wouldn't have to. I know you know this, but do you have any idea the depth of God's love for you? That God would take his dearest and, and his greatest and would lay down his Isaac for us. We can trust a God like that. We, we can give our lives completely to a God like that. And here's the thing, when we do, we will discover an incredible intimacy with God that we've never had before. It'll be more than just saving faith. It will be intimacy. Now, here's the last story I want to tell you this morning. I first heard Dennis Kinlaw preach when I was in seminary. So I was just a young 20-something kid. But when I heard him preach in the chapel that day, it, it was the very first time in all of my life, even though I'd been raised in the Church of the Nazarene, that I had heard anybody equate God's control of my life with intimacy with God as the same thing. Before, I knew God wanted control of my life, but I thought it was because he, maybe he didn't trust me. Or I thought maybe it was because God was just kind of, he had a big ego and he just wanted to have control over everything because he was God, including my life. But he said, that's not what control is about. Control is about the level of intimacy that you have with God. And then I remember Dennis telling this story. It's back when he was the president of Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, back in 1964. 
And he said, there was this young Swedish kid named Bruce who came and who visited the campus. He said, Bruce was about 29 years old. He was, he was living in Columbia at the time, but he was single. He was six foot three. He was really tall. He was skinny and he was blonde as he could be freckles all over his body. And Dennis said, I was so fascinated by his story that I invited him over for dinner one night to have dinner with my wife and I. And he said, it turns out that Bruce was a banker's son. Bruce had grown up a Lutheran. And when he was 15 years old, he said someone invited him to read the New Testament through. And, and it was the first time he'd ever read the Bible. And it, Bruce said, when, it, when I was finished, I started reading it through a second time. And the second time through the New Testament, Bruce gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And when he gave his heart to Christ, he made a decision. He went down to the local bookstore and he bought a world atlas. Now, if you're like under the age of 40, you, may, you don't know what an atlas is, but he couldn't go online and look at the world. And so he went and he bought a book that showed the world for him. And he started praying through that atlas every single day. Because he said, if the one that I love died for this world, I want to care about the world that he loves. So he would take two pages every day and he'd pray for those two countries and the people of those countries. And as he kept praying his way through that atlas every single day, there were two countries that kept drawing his attention and that he, he just kept like he was being, being drawn to them. And they were the pages for Colombia and for Venezuela. And so Bruce started to do some research on those two countries, and he discovered that there were primitive Indians living in both of those countries, deep in the Amazon jungle, who had never even known the name of Jesus Christ. They had never heard the gospel. And so halfway through his university studies, Bruce, this young man, sold everything he had, and he bought a one-way ticket to Caracas, Venezuela, when he arrived in Venezuela, he had $72 left in his pocket. And at 19 years of age, Bruce landed in Caracas, Venezuela. As he was going through customs, they asked him, how long are you going to stay here? And Bruce said, permanently. They said, well, who's going to take care of you while you're here? Who's going to take care of your finances? Bruce said, God is. They said, could you give us his Venezuelan address? And Bruce said, well, I haven't been here long enough. I'll get back to you. And the customs man said, well, that's a very noble thing to do, young man, but that's not enough for us to let you into our country. So you're going to have to go back to the United States. That was crushing to Bruce. But he went back. They took him to a room. His next plane back to the U.S. wasn't for several hours. And at dinner time, they came to him and they said, uh, Bruce, if you want to go eat in the airport restaurant, we'll let you do that. And there he was. He was sitting at the table in that restaurant all by himself when a Latin gentleman came up to him and in good English asked him the question, can I sit down with you? Bruce looked up and he said, yes, of course you can. The man sits down and he says, uh, you're a gringo, aren't you? Bruce said, yes, I am. He said, can I ask you, what are you doing all the way up here in Venezuela? And Bruce began to talk about those primitive Indian tribes that were there. And he said, I just had a real burden for them. And I, I've come to try to give my life to helping them. And the guy said, that's a very, very good thing for you to do. Can I help you? Bruce asked, who are you? The man said, well, I happen to be the personal secretary of Mr. Betancourt, who happens to be the president of Venezuela. And that very afternoon, Betancourt, the president, signed the document for Bruce to not only enter the country, but, but, but to have permanent residency in Venezuela if he wanted to. Now, that's impossible, trust me. I don't have time to tell you the rest of Bruce's story, but there's actually books that have been written about his life and the life that he led serving those tribes. But after a four-hour conversation, Kinlaw turns to Bruce and he said, Bruce, stop for a minute. You were 19 years of age. You hadn't even finished your education. You didn't have any kind of support base. You didn't know anybody in Venezuela. You were totally out there on your own. Why couldn't you wait? And he said, Bruce, 
looked away for him, from him for a minute, and then he slowly looked back at Dennis as if he had a secret he wasn't sure if he should tell. But then he said these words, because I had found an intimacy with Jesus that I was afraid I would lose if I didn't obey him completely. And after Kinlaw said those words in that seminary chapel, he looked right at me. And I don't know if he even knew he was looking at me, but he was looking right at me. And he said, you want to know the one thing that's probably lacking more than anything else in the American church today? Intimacy with Jesus. He said, we've become religious experts and we have all the language and we have all the knowledge and we have all the frills and we have all of the trappings of holiness. But he said, I don't see much intimacy. Not the kind of intimacy that God wants to have, where, where we live in such complete and total surrender that there's not a corner of our lives shut off from the control of Jesus. And he said, if you'll give him full control, that's when you begin to know the intimacy. And it was that morning in that chapel that I took my hands off and I gave God everything I knew to give. And I've never regretted that. By the way, I have to keep taking my hands off. It's a daily decision. So let me ask you as we close, what is your Isaac? What is the thing that you love the most and you're most afraid to lose? I know you love Jesus. I know you do. I know you want what he wants, but is even your Isaac on God's altar this morning? Are you 95% his or is everything under his control until there's not a corner of your life shut off from the control of Jesus? Let me tell you what I think is going to happen when you take your hands off. You'll discover a new intimacy that you've never known before. Are you wholly his?